Good evening. Thank you for coming. This is going to be so special. Um, they're all special. This one is special because um, our speaker this evening um, is George Washington, but he also goes by the name of Jim Guy. And Jim is the oldest son of Lewis and Suzanne Guy. Lewis was a past president of Norfolk Historical Society, founder of this series, or the series is named for him, and he started the series back in 2008, and uh, very beloved by one and all, and his wife Suzanne is here, and his daughter-in-law, and his son, who is back there. So now, without further ado, please welcome George Washington. I have to say, it's really nice to see such a young crowd. <laughs> when you're 286 years old, you look forward to speaking to younger people. <laughs> so, um, speaking of younger people, uh, tonight the the real theme of what I want to talk to you guys about is uh, as a teacher and as somebody that um, spends a lot of time talking about George Washington, I feel like everyone seems to think about him as an old man. And basically he was born as a 57-year-old, kind of like in the, in the uniform I'm wearing right now. And I think the real crux of him is his first 20 years. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight, I hope that you guys will get something out of, is the first 20 years. And with that being the case, I have a aide de camp in the crowd who's going to help me with a slight wardrobe change because this is the jacket he was born as a general. And I would rather show you the jacket he wore when he was a major when he first got started. Sir, I don't have a lot of practice with a microphone, as you might imagine. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Here we go. Is that good? You're great. Well, I'm used to being outside the 100 degree heat wearing this, so this is cool in here to me. We good? Okay. All right. Well, as I said, good evening. Um, I put some questions up here when I go to schools. Um, I often find that all the students know about me is that supposedly I had wooden teeth, that I could throw a silver dollar all the way across the Potomac. If you've been to Mount Vernon, you know how ridiculous that is. I don't, I don't think Max Scherz or the pitcher for the Nationals could do that. And um, they think of me as having um, <clears throat> a white powdered wig, none of which is true. I also didn't chop down a cherry tree. So in addition to those things, um, and I'm looking forward to taking your questions at the end, but in addition to those things, what I'd really like to talk to you tonight about is the answer to these questions. And what I would like to do is challenge you to think about how you would answer them today and when you were a young person. And I'm going to tell you what my answers would have been when I'm in the 10 to 20 age range. And I think you'll be surprised they might be a little different than what you might have thought. So without further ado, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to start by talking about what was your first goal or dream as a child with respect to your education. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess there are a lot of college educated people in this room. I myself am not college educated. I'm one of a handful of presidents that never made it to college. As a matter of fact, I never even went to high school. You could barely say I made it through middle school. And so part of what I talked to you about tonight is about how that affected my life and how it impacted me. But my dream, and what I'm going to try to do is I'm, I'm going to try to go to these in chronological order, but I want to kind of make this a um, seamless story. So I'm going to start with my life at around 10 years old. So uh, I was born in Westmoreland County um, in a place not far from Colonial Beach. If you've ever been in the northern neck of Virginia, it's a beautiful piece of property. And that's where I was born. And my parents' name were Augustine and Mary. And I lived there until I was about three. And um, as I got older, I, I, I learned that my mom was my dad's second wife. And he had been married to another woman before, and that I had a half-brother named Lawrence, 
and a half brother named Augustine, who was named after my dad. And I mention that because then one of those two brothers is going to play a major role in my life. So fast forward to about 10, we moved to Ferry Farm, which is in Fredericksburg. You can go visit these places today. There are natural historical uh, markers there. And when I was around eight or nine years old, Lawrence and Augustine came back from England where both of them had had formal education at a school called the Appleby School. So right, right off the bat, if you were wanting to know my first answer to the first question, the number one goal I had when I was a young boy, it wasn't to be president, it wasn't to be a general, it wasn't to get married, it was to go to the Appleby School and follow in my brother's footsteps. And they had a formal education, and I talked to my father about this, and he said, you know what, George, when you're 12 years old, Okay, I'll put aside some money. My dad had some money, he owned lots of property, and he said, if you really want to go to school there, even though my mom was not a big fan, <laughs> he said, I, I, will, I will send you there when you're 12. So I'm about 10 years old, I gotta wait two years, um, and that was something I really look forward to. And then, if we scroll down to, let's see, oh, I have a pointer, that's right. I forgot I have one of these gadgets now. I didn't have these in my day. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, if you scroll down to this question right here, how did you handle grief when the death of a loved one occurred? Um, I don't know how many of you had to deal with a parent dying when you were 10 or 11 years old, but that's what I went through. Um, I was visiting a friend down the road from Ferry Farm, and we got a note that I needed to go home as soon as possible, that my dad was very sick, and within a couple of days he died. So I'm. Just, just so this happened in April of 1743, uh, so I was just, just past my 11th birthday and my dad had passed away. And I'm the oldest son of the second marriage of my dad. So I had four brothers and sisters, and my mom right away kind of looks at me as the man of the house. And it's very unusual in the day. Her name is Mary. Mary had chosen to get remarried or pursue someone else and um, have us uh, get a second dad, and she chose not to do that. So right away, I felt the pressure as an 11-year-old to help raise my brothers and sisters and um, help on the farm. So that's okay. I'm not too worried because I just told you guys in a year, where am I going? <laughs> Appley School, that's right. So, I, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep it together. And um, I talked to my brother Lawrence, who was back, he had, um, Lawrence and Augustine had come back. Lawrence inherited, upon my dad's death, um, uh, a little property that you probably haven't heard of because it was called Little Hunting Creek. But Lawrence had been in a war in Spain and he had, um, in the British Navy, he had encountered a general, general uh, a gentleman by the name of Admiral Vernon. And he became a very good fan of this man. And, Anybody want to guess what Lawrence renamed Little Hunting Creek? Mount Vernon, right? See, I have a group. I, my audience is normally in Georgia and Florida, so I don't have a lot of Virginians. So I knew you guys would know that, but he renamed it Mount Vernon. And so my brother is now living just up the road, and I'm kind of confiding in him and telling him that I'm really struggling with helping around the house. And he said, that's all right. You're going to go to the Alpha School just like your dad promised, and it's all going to be, everything's going to be all right. So I turn 12, I go to my mom. And I basically say, um, we're going to focus on, let's see, where is it? How well did you listen to your parents growing up? <laughs> I went to my mom, and I'm not sure how much my mom knew about my dad's promise to me or not, but I was sure as heck to tell her. And I said, Dad said that I could go to the Appleby School when I'm 12. I'm 12 now. Can I go? And. Anybody want to guess what my mother said? <laughs> not, not maybe, not she said, no, not now, not ever. And my very, very first dream when I go to schools, what I do is I have the students with a notebook and they've written down their top four goals or dreams. And that didn't really, that wasn't really, really work for you guys because you guys are already probably living your dreams. But when you go to an elementary school, these are kids who have the dreams in front of them. So I tell them at that particular moment, whatever it is they said they wanted to be, I tell them to cross that. And that is an eye-opening experience because many of them barely have a plan A, much less a plan B, but I tell them to cross it out. And 
if you were asking me at 10 or 11 years old, what was my, my dream? I wanted to go to the Apple school and follow my brother's footsteps, and that dream is now dead. So I go back home, not too happy with my mom, as you can imagine, but what does a Virginian gentleman do when his mother tells him what to do? What does he say? Yes, ma'am. That's right. Yes, ma'am. So um, my mom was gracious enough to let me continue to hang out at Mount Vernon as much as I could with Lawrence. And Lawrence and I have a new, we have a new plan. So dream number two or goal number two, if you're keeping score on your card, is he said, when you're 15, you're allowed to enlist in the British Navy. Now remember, in the 1730s and 40s, we are a Virginia colony. I know you guys know that, but I have to always remind my students, we're not the state of Virginia, we are the colony of Virginia, and in every way, shape, or form, I see myself as a British subject, and I'm very loyal. And so, Lord says you can enlist in the British Royal Navy when you're 15, and then you can pursue this military career that you're interested in. And so I was like, that sounds like a great plan. So for the next three years, I worked my tail off, helping my mom out, raising my brothers and sisters, and still kind of waiting for my mom to get remarried or date. If you know anything about my mom, she had no interest in that. She, didn't, she did not get remarried when I was young. She didn't get remarried when I was older. And in fact, for those of you who are interested, when my father passed away, uh, my oldest brother Lawrence inherited Mount Vernon. My middle brother Augustine inherited um, um, what, what is known as Wakefield at the time. It's now, it's where my birthplace was. And I inherited Ferry Farm, but I wasn't supposed to get it until I was 21. So guess who was supposed to take care of it while I was waiting to turn 21? My mom. So my mom was only too happy to take care of Ferry Farm because one of my mom's great fears is she was worried about being poor. She was worried about not having enough money. And one of the unique things about the estate that my father left because he had a first wife, um, who do you think got most of the property and his, and his um, assets in his will, his first two sons? So my mother was not, there was a definite friction between Lawrence and Augustine and my mother. They never lived at the house with my mom, but it made things pretty complicated because I tried to walk that thin line between getting along with my half-brothers and getting along with my mom. So um, Lawrence has put the seed in my head about joining the Navy, and so that's what I'm going to do. So, 15 rolls around, and um, we are living right off the Potomac River where we see ships come and go all the time. And I have been pestering my mom from 12 years old on about joining the Navy. She keeps saying no. She keeps saying no, even though she knows I'm not 15 yet. So when I get to my 15th birthday, I keep saying this, and she finally changed her answer. Anybody want to guess what her answer changed to? Not no, but maybe. <laughs> Hell no is what she said at the beginning. <laughs> but when I got to, to the age of 15, she, she changed her answer. And this is what she said. She's very smart. She said, maybe. And she said, I'll make you a deal. I have a brother named Joseph who lives outside of London. Uh, quick story. The whole way that Mary meets my dad, neither one of them are from England. They're both Virginians, but they were both traveling and visiting friends of theirs in London at the same time, and that's how Augustine and Mary meet. And so they kind of meet each other, come back to Virginia, and so if you're wondering how could Mary have a brother in England, that's because that's where he's from. So she says, I'm going to write a letter to Joseph, your Uncle Joseph, and I'm going to ask him if he thinks this is a good idea. And if he says it's a good idea, I'll consider it. So I'm obviously here, you know, today, I tell my students, you would, what, what would you do today if you were trying to contact Uncle Joseph? Call him on the phone, email him, text him, I mean, you'd have an answer like that, right? So I tell my students all the time, I tell students when I go to schools all the time, you know, it took six weeks to two months for a letter to get there. That's if it made it, right? I tell them all the time, there are tons of ships that are at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean right now for correspondence that never got there and shipwrecks. So it takes two months for the letter to get there, and if you're lucky, two months for it to come back. So you're looking at about a four month time frame. And five months went by, we hadn't heard, and I am badgering as only a 15 year old son can do, badgering my mom over and over again, just waiting for her to finally say yes. And she finally says, you know what? The next ship that comes up here, if the letter's not on there, if you're that determined to go, George, you can go. So I am literally, I didn't pack a suitcase, you packed a trunk. And I had my trunk, I'm on the dock, on the Potomac, and here comes a ship, and I'm just literally waiting. I mean, you can imagine this being in a movie, and the ship 
is unloaded, the cargo comes off, there's a big bag of letters, and they, they pull the letters out and they're calling the names, and sure enough, there's a letter, and there's a letter from Uncle Zoom. And so my mom grabs the letter, of course she doesn't want me to read it, because she wants to read it first, and she, re she opens it, she reads it, and it says, Dear Mary, if you're asking my advice on whether or not you think your son, my nephew George, to join the Royal Navy. What was our first answer about what you said my mom would say? He said, hell no. He said, he is likely to be treated like a dog or worse, that it is no place for a young man. If he's lucky enough to survive it in any kind of battle, he'll be on the front lines and he'll, he'll, he'll be lucky to survive 20 years old. So at this time, I'm 6'1", 6 6'2", 6 maybe 200 pounds. My mother is all of 5'2", maybe 120 pounds. And we're sitting on the dock. And you can totally picture the scene. And as I often tell students about learning the term being a gentleman and what gentleman means, um, I have a choice to make. I have a choice to follow my dream, which is to go into the British Navy, which is, you know, the biggest, that's the New York Yankees. I know we have some Cardinal fans in the, in the audience as well. The New York Yankees of, of, of the day, they were the biggest and baddest. And what does a gentleman say to his mom when she tells him, you can't go? Say, yes, ma'am, we're okay. Now, I want to pause here on purpose. And I, I want everyone to think about just how different history could be. What if it's such a neat game to play with history? What if this happened, what if that? Just, just pause for a moment and think, if I had disobeyed my mom, and she had allowed me to go into the British Royal Navy, there was no ifs, ands, and buts, I was going. So assume that I survived the trip over, and let's even assume that my Uncle Joseph is wrong, and that I make it into the Royal Navy, and I survive, and I make it up the ranks. I have a question to ask that you guys are probably already thinking about. What side would I have been on when the revolution broke out? When the French and Indian War, you know what I, I'm on? The, I mean, it's not really in my DNA to switch sides. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the neat things about history and what if is if I had just disobeyed my mom or not listened to her, then I would have ended up in England and foreseeably stayed there. So that's one of the neat things. We're gonna do that several more times, but that's the first one that I encounter in my life where I know with the benefit of hindsight, um, I was incredibly lucky. Don't make, make no mistake, I was not thrilled that my mom was not gonna let me go. I was very upset. But um, something's gonna happen fairly around this time that's gonna change my mind and get my attention. Um, besides teenage boys seeking glory and wanting to be in the military, Young ladies and women in the audience, is there anything you can tell me that is something else that 15-year-old boys tend to pay attention to? <laughs> Girls, that's right. So I want to tell you about, I want to tell you about my, uh, there it is. I want to tell you about my first love. And those of you who are Martha Washington fans, which I am a huge fan of, I didn't meet Martha for another 13 years, so please don't get offended. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the tank for Martha, trust me. But my first love, um, some of you may know this already. Um, it was a woman named Sally Carey. And Sally Carey um, was uh, the girlfriend of my good friend Will Fairfax. And I got to know the Fairfaxes. They lived just up the road from Mount Vernon, or just down the river, I should say. And the Fairfaxes were arguably the wealthiest family in Virginia. Um, it's ironic that I'm going to end up being friends with the Fairfaxes and marrying Augustus two of the richest families in Virginia, which is gonna work out pretty well for me. But, um, uh, you know, um, luck is a part of every story. So um, I get to know Sally because Sally is dating Will. And the reason I know the Fairfax is because my brother Lawrence married Anne Fairfax. And so that they were royalty. And I spent a lot of time at Mount Vernon with Lawrence. And then when Lawrence married, uh, he married Anne right about the time my dad passed away. So I spent a lot of time with the Fairfaxes. I learned to ride a horse, I learned to dance, and as I was spending more and more time with the Fairfaxes, I spent a lot of time with Sally. And one of the neat things about going back to that term and that word about being a gentleman is you can have a crush and love somebody and never, never outwardly display that or never pursue them. And that's kind of where this goes. Uh, when I go to schools, I tell the students about this, that 
I was very much infatuated with Sally, but I did not step over the boundaries or I did not make a play for her because she was my best friend's girlfriend. However, you can argue that I probably hope that maybe if that relationship doesn't work, I can wait a certain amount of time that's considered appropriate and then I can make my play. So I, I have them on pins and needles and I tell them, so right about the time my feelings for Sally are getting stronger and stronger and I'm spending more time with Will and Will's dad, Lord Fairfax, who owned half of Virginia, you could say, he needed someone to survey his land and I'm going to become a professional surveyor because of this opportunity from Lord Fairfax. So Will and I are, Will and I are going all over Virginia, measuring it and, and, and surveying it, and then we come back and I get to know Sally more. Sally is very gracious to me. She wants me to learn how to dance. She wants me to learn how to become a better gentleman. So I'm, I'm waiting for this relationship maybe to fail. And what do you think Will asked Sally about the time I was <laughs> sure? And so they get engaged and they get married. And just as a side note, uh, again, what if? Um, we now know with the benefit of history, Sally Carey, um, who becomes Sally Fairfax, and the Fairfaxes were loyalists with a capital L. When you get to the Revolutionary War, these are people that are incredibly loyal to the king, so much so that in 1773, the Fairfaxes leave. They go back to England never to return. So again, let's play what if. Let's say something happened to Will. Let's not say let's say something it doesn't have to be catastrophic. Let's just say I end up getting together with Sally, and Sally wants me to join her to go back to England. I mean, it's kind of like there's who will never know what I would have done. But the good news is I never had to make that choice. And because of my generally background and my my um, upbringing teaching me to have self control and not do necessarily what I felt like doing. Uh, and following my, um, shall we say, my, general, my, my male urges, I, I, I exercise restraint and I don't ever make a play for her and so that relationship never materializes. So, so if you're keeping score, my first goal was I wanted to go where? To go to the Alchemy School. My second goal was to join what? Yeah. The Royal Navy, okay, two strikes, right? My third goal matters to me, I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, convoluted, but you could argue that my third goal or my third hope or dream was to marry right. So I'm over three and I'm 16 years old. <laughs> that doesn't sound like future present material, does it? None of it does, right? So um, moving right along, uh, I'm, I'm still surveying and I'm loving that. Um, in my educational background, uh, I loved math. I wasn't much of a speller, wasn't, wasn't, much, wasn't much of a reader or a writer, but I loved to work with math. And so surveying is giving me that outlet. And my skill, surveying, is gonna set me up for something that's gonna come in a couple of years. Um, so I have some good news and some more bad news to share. Um, fast forward to about my 19th year, and I have given up on joining the Royal Navy, but my brother Lawrence, is now a um, lieutenant colonel in the Virginia militia. And he has now started talking to me about, George, you should consider joining the Virginia militia. We could use a guy like you. Uh, I have some ins. Uh, I, you know, I, I know Governor Dinwiddie. And so uh, I'll put in a good word for you. And while all of that's going on, and he's, he's kind of put that bug in my ear, I'm still surveying. And I, I probably, for an 18 or 19 year old male, know more about the countryside of Western Virginia and what would be Western PA today and some of Ohio probably than anybody you'll ever meet who's that age. And while all that's going on, um, Lawrence uh, falls ill. And he has uh, what we know today as tuberculosis. And the doctors of the day, uh, as was often the case trial and error, their bright idea is we should send him to the Caribbean for just some rest and relaxation, and maybe the air there will help him heal. And for the one and only time, uh, many of you may not know this, I only left the confines of what you and I know as the United States one time, and this is it. Um, I leave with my brother Lawrence, who has now really become my father. Um, he's not my father in name, but he is, he is absolutely somebody who's my role model, my mentor, and I'm gonna go to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to go to Barbados with him, and hopefully he will recover. Uh, two very, very faithful things happened on that trip. When we go to Barbados, 
Um, he falls iller, if you will, it's not really a word, but he, he, doesn't, he doesn't get any better. And um, I contract smallpox while I'm in Barbados. Fortunately for me, obviously you guys, if I'm 286, I survive somehow, right? <laughs> but I get a mild case. And that may sound like bad news, but if you know anything about what happened to the revolution, this is now going to grant me immunity. And so um, I was ill for about a month. I had to actually go back to Virginia before my brother did um, to recover. But um, uh, they say that in um, portraits, the artist covered up the pock marks that are in my face that I got when I was a, a, a 18, 19 year old boy. So I get smallpox, I recover from that, and I go back home. And shortly thereafter, within a month, six weeks, Lawrence comes back. And uh, sadly, he does not get better. And he dies before I turn 20. So now, that's the second person in my life who is a major role model who's passed away. And um, I have to say, at that point in my life, and we know this from journal writings that I made, I'm starting to kind of feel like my life is cursed. And then something incredibly remarkable happens. As this door closed, it's almost like the spirit of Lawrence opened another door. I go to Governor Dinwiddie, and I'm going to pursue what Lawrence wanted me to pursue, which is I'm going to pursue a position in Virginia Militia. But I'm going to really honor him. I'm not interested in enlisting as a soldier. You just lost a man who was a lieutenant colonel and I'm looking for that same post. Long story short, I begged, pleaded, I got Lord Fairfax, a pretty influential guy. When you know the, one of the richest guys in Virginia, if there's a time to call in a favor and say, hey, could you write me a, 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 a recommendation? And he did, and long story short, guess who became, with no military experience whatsoever, <laughs> a lieutenant colonel in the Virginia militia at 21 years old. Now, I told you my background from about 16 to 20, I've been surveying all over Virginia and Pennsylvania and what we would know today as West Virginia and Maryland, right? Well, um, if you know anything about uh, that period of history, you've got the English who were basically, uh, other than Spanish Florida, laying claim to the coast of um, the United States and moving west. And then you have the French who've kind of come down from Canada through the Ohio River and the Mississippi River. And the, the French at that time aren't so much interested in settling there as much as they are trading, and they've made great relations with some of the natives out there, and they are starting to encroach eastward. And Governor Dinwiddie, in one of our first military meetings, says, we've been authorized by the British Crown to tell the French, hey, basically, um, get off my lawn, <laughs> in a manner of speaking. Guess who volunteered to send the notes to tell the French to get off? <laughs> That'd be me. Guess how many people the governor did when he sent with me? A guide and two horses. Because in our in our very very I guess uh, egotistical British royalty way, we're thinking that the French will simply get out when we tell them to get out. We don't need to send an army. So it's about a actually. Let me show you. Okay. So this is a map. I'm going to start out right here, and where I'm going, I have to remember I have a laser. I'm going to, my goal is I'm supposed to go to, to Pittsburgh, what you and I would know as present-day Pittsburgh. We called it Fort Duquesne back then. I'm supposed to go there and basically politely tell the French to get out. Well, it, it, right, it seems comical, but I'm, I'm you know, 21. You talk about Mission Impossible. I know there are like six or seven of those movies. This was Mission Impossible. And what I'd love to know in that room, if I could go back and show you guys, I don't think there were 50 other guys raising their hand to, to volunteer. I think I was the only one. So I go out there with a guy named Christopher Gist, who, who um, by the way, um, did I tell you guys I learned how to speak French yet? Because I didn't. So I have no way of really communicating with them. Christopher Gist was fluent in French. He knew a couple of Native American languages. So I, I, I often wonder how this trip would have turned out without him. But I, I was smart enough to take him with me. So um, I go out there with him, and a couple of things happen on that trip. Number one, we don't get to Fort Duquesne because the French hear that we're coming, and they intercept us 
somewhere right about here. And I'll make a very, well, it, right in this area, make, make kind of a long story short, um, I have the note, I give them the note, and then um, I can only imagine uh, what they were thinking because they don't respond formally for 48 hours, but the answer is, of course, French for hell no, we're not leaving. And <laughs> now um, I'm kind of, I have two, two kind of mindsets. Number one, I know that now I need to hurry back as quick as I can to tell Governor Dinwiddie they're not gonna leave, so I, we obviously know there's gonna be a conflict, but I'm also kind of going back with my tail tucked between my legs because my job was supposed to tell them to get out, and not only they're not getting out, but now they have all this extra time to prepare, so I decide, okay, rather than going back the same route we came and we went with horses, that we're gonna go a faster route and go through the mountains on foot. So um, I didn't neglect to tell you when we, when we entered into this journey, it was October. <laughs> and we got to the Ohio country in late uh, December, right before um, uh, New Year's. So on the way back, it's gonna be colder. The weather, I mean, if you guys have driven this, uh, a lot of us along the, the present day Pennsylvania Turnpike, but this route, I mean, you see all the mountains, um, it's 900 miles round trip. So we come back by foot and a couple of things happen that are of note on that journey and I'll tell you why we know this um, other than just me telling you this first person story. Uh, the weather gets so bad that we are trying to cross one of the rivers in the mountains and uh, there, I, there's ice in, the, ice in the river but it's not hard enough to walk across. So we build, it takes us all day. We have, by the way, one tool or one, one uh, we, have, we have guns, but we have one tool on the trip and it was an ax. And so we cut down some kind of thin birch trees and we try to tie them all together and we're gonna make a makeshift raft. And about halfway across, um, in an effort to try to push the ice out of the way, I fall in. And to be honest with you, Christopher Giss saved my life because he, he we, you have, you've seen those pictures of raft people use like a, Think of um, in Italy where they use the gondolas and they have those sticks, whatever you call that. He 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 put his stick out to me, really risked falling off, and he pulled me in, he pulled me in, and the the weather was so bad that we couldn't get to the other side of the river and we couldn't go back. So we found a literally a rock island, and let's just say my my hopes and aspirations and Mission Impossible kind of um, came to a came to a head when I spent the night with really. I mean, I fell in the river, so um, I'm lucky I didn't die of frostbite, but we spent, we spent one night, um, just to give you an idea how cold it was, when we woke up the next morning, the ice was frozen over, so we walked across the same river that we couldn't cross the night before. So we make it back, um, and we, um, I deliver the letter to Governor Dinwiddie, and I kept a journal. He didn't tell me to do this. I, I encourage my students, particularly my male students when I go to schools, boys, this is why you write stuff down. I kept the journal this whole, it wasn't like full of how I felt and what I thought more about what we did and what we saw. But I showed uh, in my report to Governor Dinwiddie, um, I'm expecting to get in trouble or yelled at because we don't get the French out, but he's really moved by this journal. He says, you know what? Um, I'm going to send this journal off to London because this is something I think the king should read and they'll probably publish it in the paper. So my first real experience with fame isn't when I become general, it's not when I become president, it's when my journal is published in London and in the colonies. And that's going to become a major part of how people know my name because of this journal that I kept on that journey going from here and back. Um, <clears throat> You're about to find out that that was the first of three times I was going to make that journey in a total of two years. So Governor Dinwiddie right away says, George, I want you to grab 300 men or so, get some horses, and now you are to go out here and we want you to build a fort. Now, who already knew we were going to be coming? Right, so this fort right here you see right there, the reason that's French is because we didn't build it. Um, that is the fort they're going to build. and. Before we can even get there, we get about as far as, where is uh, Jim and Bill's Glen? Right here, okay. We get about as far as <clears throat> this point right here, and the French and the, um, there's a, a diplomatic mission right here that is there when we come up on them. We have some Native Americans with us, 
and there's a lot written and talked about in this particular episode, but here's what you need to know. Um, it got very bad for the French. Um, there's a lot of documentation. What we do know is that um, several French were captured and killed. Um, several of them were scalped by some of the natives on our side that got a little bit, uh, let's say, enthusiastic, if you will. And then the primary, uh, the primary um, his name was the Half King, and the primary guy that was the leader, who was kind of my, my equal, if you will, um, he had an axe to grind with one of the French diplomats that, of course, because I don't speak French, and I don't really know what's going on because I'm so new and experienced, he steps forward, and Jumanville is injured, but he's not dead, and he takes a hatchet, and he just cracks this guy over the skull and murders him in cold blood. And the reason I'm sharing this story with you is because um, not, not, not days later, after we um, write that we have captured some friends, and this is the first skirmish, I'm kind of bragging that we've, we've struck the first blow, if you will. I don't retreat, but we back up here to the first logical place I can find. Now, re remember how much military experience I have, right? <laughs> I'm very, very experienced. <laughs> what I do is I find a, a clearing in the woods, and you can go see this today because it's still there. Um, not the fort, but the clearing. You can see, uh, I, I clear the woods um, about 100 yards in every direction, and I build a fort that you could put inside this room. Actually, you could build a, you could, it was a palisade, it was a circle, and you could put it in this area right here. I had 300 men, we put um, supplies, gunpowder, alcohol, all the things we had, and basically our idea was we we're gonna bunker down and we're gonna wait for the French to attack. And there's a few because your audience, this audience is a whole lot more um, knowledgeable than my little guys normally. Um, you guys know how this is going to work out. We were basically fish in a barrel. <laughs> and so the natives, uh, just imagine a circular fort where the woods are here, and the woods are here, and the woods were there, and the woods are back here. And the French descend upon us. Uh, oh, by the way, there was a thunderstorm raining like cats and dogs. And uh, for all intents and purposes, in this little skirmish, um, I should have been killed. I should have been dead. I was lucky to survive. We wave the white flag and we surrender. And because I know um, I'm running out of time, I, I, I can't tell you the whole, the whole rest of the story, but long story short, um, I end up having to sign a surrender. And basically what the French language that I signed basically says is, I'm responsible for everything that happened here. You guys know the famous peace treaty after World War I that Germany has to sign that basically says we caused what? We caused World War I. We were, we're responsible for everything that happened. I signed something similar without knowing what I was signing that basically said I'm responsible for all of this. I'm responsible for the murder of Jumanville and basically I started the French and Indian War. And so I, I'm being comical but, but that's exactly what really happened. Um, so I go back um, we, you know, if you think about it, um, if the French had treated us the way we treated some of their ambassadors, I could have been killed then as well, but we're released, um, and I, I hightail it back to um, Virginia, our court to Governor Dinwiddie, and my reward for my inexperience, and my, uh, he's, he's happy that I'm alive, but uh, he doesn't see any way he can't not court-martial me or demote me in some way, and so what basically happens is I lose my rank, and rather than take the demotion, and this is really what I try to talk about when I go to schools, is I'm at a critical point in my life. I'm 22 years old. I basically haven't been fired, but I've been told if you want to stay in the military, you're going to lose your rank, and you're going to just be a regular soldier, and rather than take my demotion, I say, I, I quit. And so you don't say it like that. You formally resign, so, so it's respectful, but um, basically I go back home, and remember, I'm not, I haven't met Martha yet, so I'm not married. Um, I'm still pretty uh, crushed about not ending up with Sally, and I kind of go home to lick my wounds, and then this is one of those moments in history where something really remarkable happens. In the same um, uh, path, the British, um, now that I have quote-unquote started <laughs> the French Canadian War, um, they are going to formally march, let's see, where is it? Uh, General Bragg, right here. 
they are going to formally, and when I say not with the pace that me and Christopher Gist did, they are going to formally march uh, several thousand soldiers with cannons, with gear, with food. I mean, it was, to General Braddock, it was a parade. Now, to his defense, this is the way they did it. He's a legendary general in England. He knows what he's doing. And they are going to march from here all the way up here and basically run into any French they run into, they're going to attack and they're going to run them out of town. And um, that happens about six months after my demotion. And can I get a, where is Miss Peg? Right can I get a time check? How am I doing? Uh, okay. So, should I go about five minutes more and then take questions? Is that all right? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to do, I don't want to go over for sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, and if I leave you wanting more than I've done my job, right? That's what I'm hoping to do. But um, this is an extraordinary circumstance because I tuck my tail between my legs and I do what I think my dad and my brother would have wanted me to do. I basically go hat in hand to General Braddock and say, look, I know a lot about the, the, the terrain here. I know a lot about what you're going to run into. Um, I know I can't have a um, rank, but I'm willing to help you in any way that I can. Is there a, is there a role you have for me? He said, you can be my aide de camp, which is basically like being a gopher. And I said, sign me up. <laughs> so as many of you may or may not know, one of the most extraordinary things is going to happen in this journey out there. Um, first of all, we go at a snail's pace. There are glaciers that move faster than, than General Braddock's, but he's not worried because he's going to fight it the traditional way. And so as you get further into the forest, that red coat line gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And so we are basically, as I keep telling him, sitting ducks. Um, while we were heading out there, I got sick. <coughs> And I had what you call dysentery, which was not fun. I was basically at the back of one of the horse-drawn carriages laying just nauseous, but, but I wanted to be there. And so I'm really glad that I went because along the way, um, right about up here in this area again, which is interesting because I have a lot of experience, good or bad, right around here, um, General Braddock uh, is attacked. And I told you guys I'm the aide de camp, right? I mean, I have basically no responsibilities other than getting him whatever he, I just do whatever he tells me to do. I don't have any control over men, and he had three or four generals underneath him. And in this ambush that happens, he's killed, and either his generals beneath him are killed or they are gone. Which is the worst thing you can do in an army is for the head guys to panic. And this is the moment where I would say my life takes a change. I calmly, uh, the way it was described and written about, calmly organized the men. We're not going to fight, but we're going to retreat. And I organized a retreat. And when I got home, we're back to camp that day. And someday I'll get really smart and bring a jacket that, that shows evidence of this. But my red coat, this is my revolutionary war coat, but my red coat had four um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not a musket ball. Uh, well, it, uh, it, they call it mini ball, sorry. Four mini ball, mini ball holes that were through my jacket. I had a hat shot off and two horses shot up from under me. And I wrote a letter to Augustine, my, my older half brother. And in the letter I said, um, I got my first real taste of battle today. And I have to say there was something charming about the sound of bullet, bullets whistling by. And another part of the letter I wrote, I feel that Providence has chosen me. Now, I can't say, obviously, at that time I knew what was in store for me, but I definitely felt, can you imagine when you feel like you have been handpicked to be great at something because you should be dead? I mean, if you look at several instances in my life I had dealt with death many times in my life already and escaped it, not by hiding, but maybe by being lucky. So I had some pretty um, amazing things happen to me in my first 20, 25 years. Um, I would love to go on and on, but I told Miss Peggy I would, 
I would do a time check and I definitely want to, um, I'm looking forward to your questions, most of the questions I get are about my teeth and my powdered wig, so I'm looking forward to getting some questions where, um, and don't be afraid to ask me anything because if I don't know, I'll tell you I'm 286, I may have forgotten. But I would love to open it up to any questions right now if you guys have any questions. Yes, ma'am. Can I come back and finish? If she says I can, I'd love to come back. I mean, to be honest with you, um, it's the thrill of a lifetime to present um, to the historical site, which was near and dear, obviously, to my dad's heart. And I have tried very hard, and Miss Peggy told me that that's where my dad used to sit. And I've tried very hard not to look at that chair only because um, I'm only here because of him and because of her. And so I would love to come back. So I would love to. Sure.